So thank you very much for um, having me here today. And there's one change in my talk, and that is, as you maybe can see, we're not talking about global economic change. We're actually talking about the global economic crisis and the migration of Asian women. What are the issues? So let's start with um, the crisis itself and talk about three different aspects. What were some of the antecedents? What do we know about the crisis itself? And then ask ourselves the question, is this an opportunity that we can take? Well, the global economic crisis occurred after about three to four decades of two uh, different approaches to economic and social de development. Uh, on the one hand, it occurred after about four decades of neoliberal globalization. And neoliberal globalization, um, neoliberal globalization involved several processes, such as much more use of markets than government in determining economic outcomes. And that includes deregulation and privatization. It also includes opening economies up much more to trade and production and organizing production more for export, export production. Um, there's something going wrong with this. Well, uh, try to go to the right. Is that good? Nope. Um, is is nevertheless, we're missing, we're missing a slide. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, although these processes of, of uh, globalization, such as movement of my, uh, multinational corporations uh, into more and more tiers of countries, and the use of structural adjustment policies that were required by the IMF as a condition for countries to get loans, these um, were the kinds of policies that fell heavily on women. All these policies were couched in the language of free markets. But considerable research has shown that, in fact, it was major global institutions that were propelling the change, and it was not the action of free market strategies themselves. The focus of this approach on development was um, looking at indicators such as GDP, trade, and production. Now, the other, if the slide were coming up, the other approach to social and economic development was more of an emphasis on human rights and human development. And this has been occurring over the last couple of decades. The emphasis on human rights got a lot of impetus with the fall of authoritarian regimes in the early 1990s. And here the language, is, language was on promotion of justice, gender, inequ gender equality, democracy, and rights. Also, from the early 1990s, there was increased interest in verbalization of human development and sustainable human development. Um, with the, the UN set up publishing annual human development reports, and the object was to put people rather than production at the center of the uh, development process. And the indicators that they were interested in were things like life expectancy, educational attainment, and income. Now the bottom line out of these def decades with these two processes was that actually the relative power of those institutions more interested in market processes and in seeking profits grew relative to the power of institutions that were interested in sustainable human development. So, um, what was happening in the real economy at this point in time? There was rising inequality and a diminishing of the ability of many governments to provide social protections to citizens. So the OECD released a study last November that told that in, in all of OECD countries, inequality had been increasing as had poverty. Similarly, the ILO released a study that's, that revealed that in two-thirds of the countries for which um, data was available, income inequality increased between high-income households and low-income households. 
Many nations had decreased ability to provide social protections, such as education, health insurance, unemployment, etc. And this meant that there was increased stress on households to make up the difference and to, pr to come up with good survival strategies. In many households, people had to take on additional jobs. Sometimes people had to work in the informal economy, and oftentimes people had to migrate in order to do so. So with this as a background, this was the slide on antecedents, which we seem to be missing. What are the dimensions of the crisis? What do we know about the crisis um, right now? Well, this, is, this crisis is different. It's not just confined to particular areas of the world, such as the Asian crisis, nor is it confined, <coughs> confined to particular sectors, such as the dot-com problems. This involves high-income as well as low-income countries, and it involves almost all sectors. The crisis is still unfolding, so the information that we can get about the crisis has to come from things like the most recent reports out of the IMF, the World Bank, um, and uh, newspaper reporting. So here are some of the headlines that I've been looking at over the last couple of months. These are all very recent. Towards the end of March, the head of the World Bank said, we expect the global economy to shrink in 2009. The OECD says that um, output will shrink 2.75%. Global trade is expected to shrink between 6 and 12%. This is a global recession and it also involves business closures, all kinds of financial instabilities. In terms of headlines specifically related to Asia, just last Wednesday, the uh, Wall Street Journal had a headline, Asia Looks Bleak. The World Bank had a couple of studies that came out in mid-March that said East Asian countries have had the sharpest trade losses. And countries that have grown to depend on jobs, remittances, and foreign direct investment from the Persian Gulf are beginning to see the signs of stress. If we look at a little bit more international political economy approach to this, um, both Wall Street Journal and New York Times have had major articles saying the global economic downturn brings with it the possibility of political instability. We have seen this before and we realize we can see it again. Major international institutions are struggling to deal with this economic crisis. Um, World Bank, IMF, UN, uh, OECD, all trying to figure out what to do. And just last Thursday, the leaders of the G20 met and developed some responses that included $1.1 trillion in loans and guarantees for a bailout. It also included new regulations. And quite interestingly, it included a new role for the IMF. And the IMF had been very important in restructuring economies from the mid-70s on. And because its policies were so onerous for people, it came into great disfavor. So we think, I think we have to be very careful in watching what kinds of policies the IMF is going to be implementing now. If we want to see, well, what are the effects on real people, here's some of the headlines. Asian joblessness to balloon. That was in February. A, a newspaper from the Philippines in February says migrant workers, fear, migrant workers face the worst impact. The New York Times. Laid off foreigners flee as Dubai in the Middle East spirals down. Even the Dubai online newspaper, the Khalij Online, has headlines in March saying, Bangladeshi workers head home as overseas work dries up. And Malaysia to reduce 200,000 foreign workers by next year. Now, these workers that are being released are likely those that are the most vulnerable, that don't have social protections, and a large proportion of them will be women, since many women have migrated um, from these countries. Women migrants are most at risk 
says the business mirror from the Philippines. And the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights just this March said, female migrant workers face loss of jobs and of their economic and social rights due to the crisis. So we can ask this question, um, is this an opportunity? Clearly the neoliberal system is being changed. And one key question we have to ask is, who is going to benefit from the changes in this system? Now, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz had an op-ed piece in the New York Times last Thursday that said, the people who are going to be benefit from the plan to bail out the banks in the US are going to be the bankers and the investors in the banks. And the taxpayers will bear the losses that occur. He says that a little bit more bluntly. He says, the gains that can come from this will be privatized and the losses will be socialized to all of us. So we need to ask ourselves, is there an opportunity though to push for change that brings in more human development, more human rights in this? And in this regard, in the US, some groups had asked the Obama administration in setting up the stimulus package for our economy to be sure to include programs that benefit both men and women. And in particular, to um, add projects in health care, child care, education, and social service. These are projects that both benefit women and all people, but they also provide jobs to women. So, question is, can we do this internationally? Can we leverage for support for more human development? Let's take a look at migration um, and three things we want to do here. Take a look at um, what's been the view of international <coughs> organizations regarding migration, what's been the role of women in migration, and in particular, what about Asian women? Okay, so first thing. Um, the view of migration by international organizations. There's been a lot of attention to this in this decade, both in conferences and in publications. And there's been glowing, growing recognition that migrant flows are gendered and that the, their experiences can be quite different. Now, um, and your handout will reflect that when you have time to look over your handout on what some of these initiatives have been. However, the emphasis and the interpretation given to migration has evolved over this decade. At first, the emphasis was on managing migration. And the idea here was that they wanted to maximize the benefits of migration, getting jobs for, for its citizens that they sent abroad, getting money sent back, remittances. They wanted to maximize these benefits while minimizing the abuses that could come with migration because many migrant workers, in fact, have faced abuse abroad. Um, however, the UN held its first ever conference on migration in September of 2006, and then this was followed by an annual conference every year thereafter. This conference that they held was called the High Level Dialogue on Migration and Development. And you'll notice that the focus in the language now has become migration and development. And migration has now become an explicitly a policy, a strategy for development. For those of us that have worked in this field, migration and development were two different fields. And so policies were established differently and independently. Now they're together, now they're seen together. Migrants are now seen as agents of development. And in particular, the remittances that immigrants send back home have been increasingly seen as a source of funding for development. So these funds could replace funds that would be domestic funds devoted to development endeavors. And interestingly, the flows of remittances to many countries are greater than overseas development assistance 
and greater than foreign direct investment. So labor sending countries have tried very hard to leverage the use of remittances. They have tried to improve financial systems so migrants can send back their, their uh, earned monies much more efficiently and at lower cost. Countries have also tried very hard to urge migrants to not only send the money back to their families, but also to send them back to hometown associations, HTAs, that then will invest in community development and community infrastructure, even things like roads, um, in addition to schools. Some observers have even suggested that remittances have become the new hot topic, the new way to, re to uh, address poverty, uh, even replacing microenterprise as the most prominent new strategy. But there have been some cracks in this migration as a development strategy model. Last year, the Migration Policy Institute published its top 10 migration issues of 2008. And for the first time, we're seeing things come up such as remittances. So there's a question of, are remittances going to hold up under these circumstances? Second thing we're seeing is an issue, return migration. So are migrants going to be sent back home? And if so, then what do we do with them? And lastly, xenophobia. And that hadn't been an issue on their agendas in previous years. Previously, if, if immigrants went abroad, they would either be considered to be assimilated in the country, the destination country, or multiculturalism would be prevailing and people would get along. There would be no hatred, no rising xenophobia. Um, role of women in migration. Now, um, internationally, there's about 200 million people that live outside their country of origin. Women are just a smidge under 50% of that total. You might have heard that um, migration has become feminized. That's not quite right because the share of females in the stocks of people living abroad hasn't changed too much since the 60s. But what has notice noticeably changed is that more women are migrating for work than ever before. Um, in some of my earlier work, I have shown how women have been pushed by these processes of globalization that, that I mentioned in discussing neoliberal globalization, that they have been pushed into um, working in informal economy work. They've been pushed into working as maids or domestics or as entertainers, which often means sex work or they've been pushed into subcontracting production networks or into microenterprise. Many of these women have been pushed into migrating in order to obtain such work. On the other hand, in addition to these supply side factors, there's been demand side factors that there's been an increased demand in Western Europe and in the U.S., particularly for caring labor, whether it's within households or in institutions. And partly this is propelled by the fact that many countries cut back in, this, in the social provision of services. And that now these had to be done privately and they needed people from elsewhere in order to do this. This is where we get the notion of uh, global care chains or the globalization of care. Now, in terms of Asian women, one of the challenges in speaking of Asian women migrating is that there's so many different dimensions to um, these women's profiles. And it's important that we understand uh, what these are because the outcomes of migration, in other words, what kind of job you get and what your working and living conditions are like <coughs> depends an awful lot on these four things. Where you go to, mi where you migrate to, what your own personal attributes and characteristics are, um, the types of work that you obtain, and lastly, the policy framework. What kinds of policies has, has your source country and destination country set up? So let's take a look at these, knowing that 
Women live in multiple spaces and they endure multiple power structures. We have to understand their lives in this context. So, women migrate to uh, Western Europe and North America. They also migrate to high income countries in Asia. And there's two different groups of high income countries. There's the countries around the Persian Gulf in West Asia. There's also several East and Southeast Asian countries that are big destination countries. Um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. These are destination countries. Now, another set of countries in Asia has become the major sending countries. These are countries like the Philippines primarily, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, China, Nepal. All. So the, the countries are, are very different. The female share of emigrant flows varies widely. So the females are a, a large proportion of migrants from the Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia. And in fact, in 2006, females were about 60% of the migrants from each of those countries. However, on the other hand, Females are only 5% of the immigrants from Bangladesh. We'll see some reasons for this in a couple of minutes. It's important to note that when women migrate internationally, they create new spaces, new networks and new transnational spaces. And these networks are really very important for acclimating a migrant in a new country and for creating a sense of community as well as when injustices are encountered, these networks are a basis <coughs> upon which women can take action to improve their situation. Now, there's also diversity in the people's attributes. And the outcomes of migration are going to vary on all these different characteristics. Let me give you a couple of examples. <coughs> um, regarding nationality, um, let's take Singapore. If you were a Filipina maid in Singapore um, at the beginning of this decade, you might get one to two days off a month. If you were an Indonesian maid in Singapore, you might get one day off a month. Um, and if you were Sri Lankan, you might get in between. So there's a pecking order. Filipinos would get the most, Sri Lankas, the less, and Indonesians would be in the worst position. Ethnicity also kind of works this way. Women migrating from Sri Lanka, women who were Sinhalese would be paying more in fees than women who were from the Muslim uh, background. So Asian women migrants have very complicated identities based upon all these different characteristics. And because of this, they can face multiple discriminations. Here's an example of that. Filipina nurses in Saudi Arabia. They can be, they're discriminated against because they're women, because they're from another country, and because if they're nurses, they're in a profession where it's taboo to have touching across gender lines with people who are not married. So, these women have complicated multiple identities, they face multiple discriminations, and in addition, they are multiply invisible. Types of work that they go to. Female migration internationally is really concentrated basically in a few female-dominated um, type in occupations. Asian migrant women have been pushed and pulled, as I described earlier, by the processes of globalization into largely marginal jobs such as maids and domestics um, and care work and sex work. Now, just to put that in perspective, um, in 2005 from Sri Lanka, 90% of the women leaving Sri Lanka went to work as domestics. So this is a huge category. Uh, from the Philippines in 2006, 69% of women leaving the Philippines were going to be working as domestic workers or caregivers. So these are very uh, prominent occupations. Now, women also leave to do some factory work, and particularly in subcontracting networks. And we are certainly seeing at the other end of the occupational spectrum that there are women in higher income jobs. 
people leaving, um, say, the Philippines to work as nurses abroad, to work as teachers abroad, or to work in high-tech um, sector industries. Now, very important last factor upon which there's much diversity in the migration of Asian women, and that's the role of governments. Governments of these countries, labor exporting countries, have faced a double bind because on the one hand, the governments have a really strong incentive to push citizens to go abroad because this lowers unemployment in the country and provides these people with incomes that they will send some back to their own country. But on the other hand, a government has at least some obligation to its citizens to protect them from abuses abroad. And there's been some infamous cases of people that have gone abroad to work, women that have gone abroad, and been seriously abused. In trying to balance these dual goals, governments have different views of the appropriate roles for women. And they can set up their policies regarding outmigration accordingly. And so it's not too surprising that some of these policies for outmigration discriminate against women, often in the name of protecting women. If we look at three different case studies, um, let's do the Philippines. Because the Philippines has had sort of the premier labor export <coughs> machine for decades. It started labor export in 1974 and institutionalized it in development plans. Labor export still is in Philippine development plans this decade. At first, the immigrants were males. They were going to the Middle East that was building its infrastructure with all the cash they had from oil. But soon the demand from the Middle East shifted and they wanted domestic workers. So the Philippines thought about it and decided, well, we're gonna hold off a little bit. We wanna ban women from doing this because we want to force the destination countries into setting up mechanisms that will protect our workers abroad. Well, that created a backlash. First of all, the destination countries did not set up policies to protect migrant female workers. And secondly, some of the migrant female workers that were already abroad, say in Hong Kong or Singapore, resisted this. And this kind of pointed up to a class difference. The women who were already abroad said, we need our jobs, we need our income, please don't do this, we're resisting. Um, and this showed the difference between them and the government officials that wanted to protect them. Female migration then dominated from the Philippines. This went on for years, but it creates some family um, some family dislocation, and by 1995, President Ramos of the Philippines was getting very concerned about possible family instability of having particularly a mother abroad. So there was a movement to try to encourage Philippine women to come back home or to stay home. Again, this didn't work, but it shows another double bind the state was in. It needed them, on the one hand, to leave, to send back money, but it also needed family stability because that contributes to social stability. In 2002, President Arroyo, a woman, decided to change the, um, the approach to migrant workers. So she encouraged overseas Philippine workers to stay overseas, and she said, we would like to invite you to be overseas foreign investors in the Philippines. So the idea was that the women and men would send their money back to the Philippines, not just to their families, but to collectives that would invest in development. Females continued to dominate the flows from the Philippines until the middle of this decade. In 2005, a lot of Philippine sex, Filipino sex workers in Japan were being abused. So Japan set up um, more strict entry requirements for entertainers, and entertainers often slip into sex work. Um, in addition, the Philippine government itself decided there should be baseline pay for domestic workers abroad and said we want our domestic workers to be paid $400 U.S. a month. Well, not surprisingly, these two actions that were taken in the, in the, to in the best interests of women, has resulted in, in lower female migration from the Philippines. So the women's share is now less than half. Sri Lanka came a little bit later to the game of labor export, and they were sort of shut out of the male export model. 
they turned to export of women and promoted it because their neighbors, um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, forbade women uh, being Muslim cultures, um, some of them. Um, but abuses began to surface after 20 years of, of their migration, and so the Sri Lanka began to focus more on promoting male immigration. Bangladesh has had a very seesaw approach to the export of females. Putting all these four dimensions together, the geographic dimensions, the personal attributes, the types of work, and then the government policies, we get a very diverse picture of Asian women migrating. However, there are still some general issues that we can talk about and must talk about. So, our major issues are that gender inequality persists. There's a tremendous lack of data on migration we're going to take a look at the pros and cons and the expectations of what's going to happen in the crisis and then examine the problems of migration as a development strategy. So with respect to gender inequality persisting, um, the UN Commission on the Status of Women last year in March concluded global commitments on the achievement of gender equality and women empowerment since the Fourth World Conference on Women, that was in Beijing 1995, have yet to be fully implemented. And this commission was very concerned about insufficient political commitment and resources devoted to gender equality. Now, these major international institutions have pledged to mainstream gender, and that means that they pledge to integrate gender concerns throughout their organizations and throughout their programs. But, and in fact, an interesting plan uh, that Gail and I were just talking about before was the World Bank has a gender action plan. And it has a little paper that it says, uh, gender equality is smart economics. And so it's a four-year plan set up in 2007 to go to 2011. And so gender equality is supposed to be not only good ec economics, um, good for growth, period. However, many scholars and practitioners have been examining gender mainstreaming and come up with a conclusion that this hasn't worked yet. And they're pointing out that although the language <coughs> of integrating gender throughout organizations and programs is present, if you look at the real power structures and what's going on in these organizations, it's not happening. Now, the lack of gender equality is particularly a serious issue for migrant women. The ILO has been concerned that increasing numbers of Asian women migrating for work are the most vulnerable people to exploitation and abuse more vulnerable than males, more vulnerable than native-born women. And they have published very extensive guides to preventing discrimination, exploitation, and abuse of migrant women workers. Nonetheless, much remains to be done. Now, this is all compounded by the fact that women's economic and social problems intensify in a crisis. Past crises can be somewhat instructive in this. So if we look back in the, at the effects of the East Asian crisis in the late 90s, studies show that poverty rose, health and education indicators declined in Thailand, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Women were particularly hard hit. For example, in South Korea, women's employment fell twice as much as men's employment fell. Very serious problems are anticipated for women in this crisis. The UN Commission on Women that just met in March of this year added a special panel to its conference. The panel was on gender perspectives of the financial crisis. And according to experts on this panel, they're saying the crisis is expected to be worse for women and children since they are the majority of the poor. Women will lose millions of jobs. Um, women's income will be greatly reduced. They estimate that infant deaths each year will go up by 200 to 400,000 and that many, many girls will be pulled out of schools. 
they suggest that a solution is that we must have a gender equality perspective in all stimulus plans. Kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning was requested of the Obama administration. To cite the UN Commissioner on Human Rights just once again, she speaks a little bit more forcefully and saying that the discrimination that exists against women, political, economic, and social, is going to get worse in this crisis. She also says we need gender sensitive policies, but she's very concerned that the people who are making policies internationally right now are largely male finance ministers and male leaders. And in fact, we just saw this last Thursday at the G20. Now, another serious problem that's related to the fact that gender equality does not exist is there's a lack of data on migration, particularly female, female um, migration. Um, there's, a, there's a gross lack of data on all migration because at best, data only captures those migrating um, officially, in other words, with documents, legally. And it leaves out what's going on with unofficial migration or undocumented migration. But from, certainly from my perspective, as someone who wants to do gender research, there's just a dire lack of data on gendered migration. Many countries don't collect data on migration by gender at all, just by you know, male, female, let alone getting really helpful information such as um, reasons people are migrating. Why are women migrating? Where are the women going to? What kind of jobs are they taking? What are their wages? What are they going to be sending back home? What are their ages? What is their marital status? Are they leaving kids back home? All this information is information that we as researchers and people interested in fair and human development need. So, Research is hindered between countries. We can't do it without the data. It's also hindered longitudinally. We can't examine it over time without really good data. This is really frustrating. And it obscures the fact that there are real differences between males migrating and women migrating. And lastly, of course, there's a, there's a lack of data on what's happening right now as we gather, what's happening to migrants, men, women. And then in turn, given what's happening to them, what's, hap what's the effect on their families, their communities, their nations? Now, there are some solutions. Um, the World Bank is actually urging that significant resources be allocated to collecting better data on migration that's broken down by gender. And it says this is needed to inform future policy making. There's a really interesting project that's going on in Asia that was um, established in May of 2007. And it's um, the Migration Information System. It's on your handout also. And so they are trying to, uh, first of all, they wanted to get a bench line of what migration data is in 12 countries in Asia. They just published this. Um, in uh, the Asian and Pacific Migration Journal at the end of 2008. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the status of data is um, in 12 different Asian countries. And now they'll be working to try to improve things now that they understand it. Okay, looking at the pros and cons of migration and what we think the likely effects then are going to be in this crisis. And we need to look at it for se through several levels. First of all, if we look at it from the level of the individual migrating, okay, on the positive side, the individual gets a job, has some money, and can send some money home, that, that, that feels good. There's an increased sense of worth from having a job. Some, some women leave because they're escaping abusive situations, and migration is a way out. Now, uh, there's a downside to all this. There's a cost. And uh, some of you that are students in Dr. Summerfield's class have, have read this article where I delineate the, the flip side of this. Many women have been discriminated against, although certainly some women and their families have benefited from this process. They can be discriminated against by their employers. They can have a heavy workload, work long hours, have low wages, no benefits poor working conditions, 
poor living conditions if you're a live-in maid. Um, they may have, um, they may suffer abuse that's verbal, that's physical, that's sexual. There's health risks, there's stress, there's exhaustion, there's STDs. Um, there's little job security. Oftentimes there's little freedom of movement by these, by these people and immigration or documents are taken. We can, we're beginning to get the idea that these women may also be in a sense exploited by their country because the country has, their own country, their source country, because they've been encouraged to migrate and then they've been encouraged to send their money back for investment in their communities. Well, think about that. So these injustices have led to a lot of organizing and there's a lot being written about the agency of women abroad who have suffered um, these injustices. In the global crisis, it's likely that the advantages of migration are going to be eroded. And that for those that still hold their jobs, um, some of the disadvantages will be intensified. Now, the ILO just wrote something in February of 2009 saying that the effect on women is going to depend on where you are and what kind of job you're in. So for example, if you have migrated as a domestic worker or a low-skilled worker or in uh, factory production, you'll probably be hit a lot harder than a high-level professional, a nurse for example, who has migrated to work in a public institution abroad. So the outcomes are going to depend. One very troubling aspect of the crisis is going to be that as people lose jobs and become more desperate to find monies for their families as women lose jobs, that there can be an increase in undocumented migration. So people will be moving without proper documentation. That makes them more vulnerable. And in the worst case, trafficking, which is another whole talk that I can give. Um, I won't at this moment. Um, when we look at families, in source countries, obviously families benefit from having a worker go abroad because the money is being sent back to them. They can spend on basic needs, better housing, perhaps setting up a micro enterprise. The downside is, if it's a woman who's migrated, that person's labor is gone from the household. And so the internal dynamics of the house change and people have to figure out how they're going to get work done and care work done. This can be a serious problem and a long-term de detriment to families. Um, in destination countries, families that hire a domestic worker uh, benefit. Um, they benefit in that it can allow um, more people in the household to enter the paid labor force. It can also solve the problem of who does what in the destination household um, because they solve that problem, it's, let's just say it's a male-female household, they solve the problem of who does the work by bringing someone in from the outside to do the work rather than dividing it up among themselves. In this global crisis, it's likely again that the benefits of the migration will be uh, eroded. Now if we look at the level of communities and nations, um, on the positive side, as we've said, it lowers unemployment to have out migration. Monies flow back. Um, they flow back to individual families. They can also flow back to hometown associations. Um, migration has been cast as um, also allowing for new skills to be brought back home and new cultural perspectives to be brought back home. But conversely, there are costs. Actually, there's been a lot written about a brain drain from source countries to destination countries. Also, a care drain, uh, particularly as nurses leave. Nurses that the Philippines has trained, they go somewhere else to provide health care. Um, another cost of migration on the community and nation level is that communities that have a lot of, of um, migrants send back remittances, and inequality can grow between communities within a nation. Globally, we are seeing a number of changes. We have talked about global care chains. There are other global labor chains that we could also discuss. Um, we see growing transnational movements to help migrants, mo movements that are truly 
truly transnational, not just international or multinational. And we see that in this decade, many international organizations are now turning their attention to um, the, the problems of immigration. Overall analysis, so we're seeing immediately that the advantages of migration are likely going to be eroded in this, in this crisis. So loss of jobs, return migration, what do we do with all these people? Um, decreased remittances, increased abuse of people that still have jobs, um, xenophobia, possibly more irregular migration, and trafficking. But there's a bigger problem, and that's the whole problem of migration as a development strategy. So a couple of things here before we close. That is, we're seeing dangers in relying on remittances as the engine of development, as the funding for development. Um, although remittances had been pretty stable in the past because migrants felt a, a huge obligation to send money back to their families. For the first time, the World Bank's expert just published um, a position paper in March that said it's expected that remittances will fall 5 to 8 percent to developing countries. When remittances don't hold up, there's a big effect on families, communities, and nations. But we have to ask ourselves, even if remittances would hold up, is this, this, is this a sound development strategy? Uh, to rely on lower middle class, lower class people, particularly women, as a major part of your economic development strategy. Critics of the migration as a development strategy say that the export of people does not solve a nation's fundamental problem of economic development. In fact, it helps a nation avoid the problems. It allows them to not face the structural conditions that need changed in their own country and redistribute resources to alleviate poverty. Even IMF personnel have said the bottom line is that remittances cannot be a substitute for sustained, domestically engineered development. So what we've seen in this analysis one way of looking at it is to say these women are basically subsidizing their families by migrating even though people are benefiting they are in fact subsidizing their families they're subsidizing their home country and they're subsidizing the destination country as we've said they subsidize the home country because instead of the government providing this needed social services to their families these people's remittances come back home and provide their families with the education and health care they need. It's a more privatized social insurance system. They're also subsidizing their home states because they're providing funds for community development that otherwise the state might be required to, to provide. They subsidize countries of destination because if you think about it, these countries get the benefits of their labor without having ever had to train these people. In addition, if the labor is caring labor, then um, the state in the destination doesn't have to provide that labor publicly. So the, it's basically shifting the cost of development to migrants and their families. So I think we're having a, we just take a minute and Oh, okay. Sorry. We're just down to our last two slides. Yeah, I know, I know. Sure. I'll take a drink. Okay. And it is recorded so we can find out what happens at the end. Right. The thrilling conclusion. Okay, I think we're good. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to say, um, what kind of development strategy do we want to have? Is this an opportunity to leverage for a more humane, uh, rights-based development? The neoliberal model is being changed. We want to make sure it's being changed to the benefit of the most people. So how can we incorporate these changes for more gender-sensitive, migrant-based human development? So last slide. Some of the dimensions of this approach can be the following. We really have to understand 
the structure of power internationally, politically, economically, socially. Um, we really need to take a multi-level approach as opposed to either a micro or a macro type approach and to look at what's happening with the interactions between families, communities, nations, and global, global spaces. It's extremely important to use gendered analyses and gendered indicators as measures of our success or not. And at the national or an in international levels, it seems like a reasonable idea to advocate for stimulus packages that benefit both men and women. It's important to support international organizations that are working towards more humane development. And lastly, it's particularly important to monitor the IMF and make sure that it's not returning to the conditionalities that were so onerous on, on ordinary people in, from the 1970s to the 2000s. So I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to any questions you have or comments. For those of you who can stay, we can take some time for discussion now, and I'll let you have over this question. Yes. Um, Gail Summerfield will need to supply the exact citations here, but um, the seminar that you referred to earlier um, read two pretty recent, meaning kind of, I think, the beginning of this year, probably two reports on expected effects of the economic crisis on migration. And I, I think one was from the Migration Policy Institute, not positive about that. I think another one may actually have been from a IMF or World Bank study group, but in any case, uh, two, um, two uh, kind of short reports. Uh, I want to make sure I don't misrepresent them. Both of them noted uh, likely uh, impacts. Um, but in general, no. Uh, both of them uh, projected um, uh, fairly minor sort of impacts. The, the, the two areas that I can recall were, first of all, migration itself. In other words, how much is the crisis likely to reduce the volume of migration? and they're generalizing at a very broad level, which might be part of the problem. It might speak to your points at the end about relative lack of data regarding gender and other kinds of social difference. Um, but they, they were actually quite striking, and I was very surprised by the projections. Uh, they said they expected uh, little, uh, you know, some, some reduction in the volume of migration, but not very much. Uh, they expected some return migration, in other words, for economic reasons, people would lose jobs and then return home not too much. Uh, and for remittances, uh, they said that they, it might cut in a little bit, uh, but actually they expected that there would not be a real substantial uh, reduction in remittances, and they tried to explain why. So um, <clears throat> this is the last, this is actually a question for you, uh, <laughs> given a, you know, a very different sort of uh, take today. And um, uh, I'm much more sympathetic with the, the sort of projection that you're suggesting here, I think with good reasons or practical reasons. But um, I wondered whether the working hypothesis could be that uh, this, a, a lot of this optimism has to do with operating at an extremely sort of general level, uh, which actually my recollection, somebody here that's in the seminar can correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is virtually no recognition at all for gender differences and uh, an inability apparently to break down the data along those lines and all kinds of other, not just gender, other issues that you. So I guess the question is, who should we believe and why? Oh, that's a good question. And, and actually, you know, I've been reading this stuff and in preparation for doing this, I've got this big pile of articles, you know, the projections for remittances, for example, and been following it right up to practically getting on the plane yesterday as to what's going on. And it's been particularly interesting following uh, Dilip Ratha, and I may be mispronouncing his name, who's the World Bank expert on remittances. And, you know, if you print out what, what he's been saying for a long time, he kept saying remittances are not going to be curtailed. Remittances will stay stable because 
The migrants will find more jobs. They will move to get better jobs. They will cut back their own living standards. They are going to send the same amount of money home. Well, on March 23rd, he released a different projection that um, there was going to be a 5 to 8 percent reduction in what was being sent back to developing countries. <clears throat> and I think you've identified some of the problems, and I think one problem that you haven't identified is that this is such uncharted territory, and we have such, so few um, <clears throat> indicators from the past to suggest what is going to happen in a case where it's truly a global, a global crisis that there's been, um, it, it's an ongoing unfolding of what they think will happen. You know, I think the expectations were that things would stay, would stay stable, and now they're beginning to realize, um, as, as the, um, the, the numbers are starting to come in, that things are going down. And in fact, there are worldwide indicators in different places um, outside of Asia as well as within, that remittances are going down. <clears throat> so on that case, I would say, believe those that are looking at the numbers, that remittances are going down. In terms of the numbers of migrants, I think that's a really interesting aspect because we don't know what's going to happen. Again, if people are really, really desperate and feeling they have to get out of their, their situation, but they can't get out of their own country through formal channels. Are they going to go informally? And will we know that? And I know that it, it seems, with at least respect to Mexico, that the flows from Mexico have gone down, the flows from Mexico into the US. <clears throat> it's interesting, getting data out of Asia at this point in time is hard. You know, not only is there not much data collected, but then to really find out what's happening. But this one newspaper that I was following from Dubai online, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, C, it's K-H-A-L-E-E-J, Khalij. And so you look at it, you know, it's literally talking about Bangladeshis being sent home, and it's talking um, about, in Malaysia, 200,000 people being sent home. And I think you can find this kind of evidence in, in newspaper reports, and of course we all know enough to not base our analyses on newspaper reports, but at least it's some kind of an indicator. So I think we're at a situation where some of the stuff that you might have read two months ago is now actually been changed and updated, and the situation, at least for this point in time, is probably more dire than, than what you are reading then. And this is something that, you know, for those of you that are interested, can keep following and seeing, in fact, what is happening. Marianne. Part of the issue also is how long a perspective you take. The immigrants typically are probably at least in their 20s. Uh, now, <clears throat> to young people, 20 years seems forever. To me, it does not. <laughs> uh, eventually, these people reach retirement age in the foreign countries. This has gone on for a long time. What happens then? Do they return home? Do they become a drain on resources at home when they are no longer employed, either on their families or if the countries are more civilized than the one we live in through public services? Uh, what happens in the long run? That's a very important question, and um, that also calls for the fact that we need data on return migration. And um, in researching this, um, there's virtually no data in Asia, for example, on return migrations. They just aren't collecting it. So the special issue I referred to of the Asian and Pacific uh, Migration Review says that flat out. There's not data on return migrations. And so that, you know, you're identifying a, a very serious um, matter because countries in establishing social policy need to be able to know what, what are the returns and what do we how do we need to plan for them? What do we need to do to accommodate their needs? I just want to supplement this. It especially occurred to me, I met a young woman 
the conference in Italy this summer. Uh, she was born in Kuwait. She has a good job as an economist. Uh, but her parents were from Egypt. Her parents will never be citizens and neither will she. <laughs> so they are not entitled to benefits in Kuwait once they reach retirement age. And this would aggravate the situation. I hope this is not common. I do not know. And I, I think that's another whole area that we don't know anything about. So we could add that to the list of things we need to know because as, you know, as her parents are older, that becomes a, a matter of great concern to them as individuals as to, you know, where are the, where's the social safety net? Where are the protections for me? And it would be especially difficult if they've lived in Kuwait for decades and then need to go back to a country that is now not as familiar to them. And if the walls are conflicting, this young woman is potentially not a citizen anywhere. Oh my, the woman without a country. <laughs> Yes. I have a question about the migration of people from the developed countries like Taiwan or maybe even the U.S. to these developing Asian countries and how that might be impacted by the financial crisis. A lot of these people um, migrate to the developing countries because in the past the economy there has just grown tremendously and there are lots of business opportunities. Have you looked into this at all? No, I haven't, um, because I've been looking at you know largely women and you know mostly because of the predominance of the jobs they're going into, mostly the lower end. Although I've done some higher end, but I think that that is really interesting because um, I've done some work on Singapore, for example, and there's certainly been a lot of Chinese that have moved into Singapore because of huge business interests. And so now Singapore, for example, is in one of the um, you know biggest recessions it's ever been in since independence. And you know, it is a very good question, what is going to happen to the Chinese entrepreneurs who came in? Um, I don't know that much about Taiwan myself. So if you have done research yeah, on that, that was just comment. an example, but there, there are just so many countries that um, have, um, they receive, the developing countries receive um, Asian and also Western business people. And then those business people, maybe men, marry the local women, and that also impacts women. It's not that they're migrating, but the people who they are establishing their families and their lives with uh, are immigrants. And what happens if there are no more business opportunities? How does that impact the local women who might have other networks um, that they can leave one husband and go to another? Right, right. And so, you know, again, between these comments, we're identifying a much larger agenda of information that we really need um, in order to do good social policy. I was just going to add that one of the pleasures of being at a large university like this is that we have students doing some of this cutting edge work. And really, this is an area that people have identified and, and several students are beginning to do work on various aspects of, of some of this, uh, some of the topics that we just uh, touched on. But the trouble is, while those add a whole lot, we also need this other level of data to try to find out how representative the small studies or the case studies are and that's really lacking to, uh, completely at this point. Yeah, um, some of the, I, I was just reading um, an article published in 2008 on the effect of remittances in Sri Lanka. And um, I mean, this person who was writing the article was trying very hard to make some conclusions based upon you know, virtually no data and just a few case studies in a couple of communities mm -hmm. and trying to piece together what is really going on? And um, so it, it is extremely frustrating. And there's a whole negative influence by the receiving country, the low wage workers that uh, as the crisis worsens and our unemployment increases, the jealousy over the um, um, immigrants taking away the jobs that nobody wants to do. Yes, we do want to do those. And there's so many coming, the, price, the wages are so low. If they just didn't come, we would be better off. So they have a whole working milieu of being with and around 
and the abuse and um, the um, community abuse of they bricked our community, the language is different and so on and so forth, upheaval that had never existed. I'm quite familiar with some of the Iowa packing plants, uh, towns mm -hmm. and so on, or turkey farms or whatever, so that uh, the negative influence, whether women or men receive worse abuse or disgust, this continual uh, effacing their self-worth in this new country uh, being seen as enemies. Right. I mean, we certainly are seeing that in the U.S. Um, you mentioned Iowa. Um, there's a lot of, you know, um, xenophobic, racist things going on in Georgia, you know, similarly in agriculture and whatever, and a rise of a lot of hate groups. And so, you know, the idea that multiculturalism would be our norm um, is, is, certainly, is certainly faded, and it's also fueled by, you know, a lot of talk show type people and, and um, you know, uh, TV demagoguery that is, is um, not, you know, looking in a reasoned manner at, you know, what's happening. And so, you know, the xenophobia rising and, and then what it does to, you know, people, I think you raised a really good point. It's, um, it would be very um, disturbing to be in the position of a lot of those people where you are sincerely trying to do good things. Um, and I have talked with people, this is more anecdotal, but that, no, there aren't, there aren't people in, for example, the U.S. that will do these jobs. You know, our good workers are from, you know, country X, Y, Z. You know, we cannot get. Now, maybe if things get bad enough, some of the U.S. workers will actually decide, okay, maybe I will do that job. Um, but again, this is, this is uncharted territory. It's interesting that these two reports that I mentioned earlier, which, which tended, which seemed to me to be overly optimistic on the economic issues, actually were kind of pessimistic on this issue. In other words, they noted that there, there's already a reaction is already setting in a number of different places, and their projection was that as economic conditions get much worse and you have unemployment among the native-born population as well as among the migrants, they would expect that this kind of xenophobia would increase. If I could just add one little piece, it has to do with what uh, Marianne mentioned. Early on in the semester, uh, a major concern was actually the relationship between social policy and migration. And a couple of cases that we looked at were uh, Germany, where uh, a whole generation, not every single person, but many of the Greek guest workers did stay. They did not go back to, to Turkey and drew on the resources of the state. And another case was the Netherlands, and uh, the, the argument seemed to be that um, the rise of intolerance, and, and to be blunt, the political right in these societies, right-wing political organizations and, and social organizations, seemed to be tied to this issue of social policy, uh, to the extent that you keep it at all. We don't have to worry about that too much in the United States because we don't have a lot of welfare policy left. But uh, in, in many of these societies, you do and migrants who stayed drew on it, and as somebody mentioned earlier, that was another claim against them then, that uh, these are people who are really not citizens but are drawing on the resources of the state. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, it's, it's this issue that you ask us to think about, about social policy, I think is actually quite important. It's very important. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, you mentioned how, like, the IMF and the World Bank have come out with statements saying they want to address gender inequality. Um, but to my understanding, a lot of that inequality is kind of embedded in the cultures of uh, Southeast Asian and South Asian yes. countries. Um, do you know how much of a factor that plays in the overall um, economic inequality? That is a good question. And I think it depends on um, the region, um, I, th I think certainly, you know, cultural attitudes about appropriate roles for women that are very, very narrow have a huge impact on, on what happens. Um, and it makes it extremely difficult. Um, I mean, we're, we're seeing a huge turnaround, say, in Afghanistan, you know, with the political power of the Taliban rising and now marital rape being declared just fine, um, legal. Um, 
the, the whole thing about gender inequality, though, even in the, in the quote, more enlightened or advanced countries, there's still, in looking at the power structure, there's still, um, you know, if you want to be a legitimate wor person working, say, in the World Bank, and you're doing gender issues, see you later, um, then you're not considered, you know, a serious player, I think, is, is wh what's happening. So that if, you know, if you went out and got a job with the World Bank and you were a, a bright young analyst, but you really wanted to work on gender issues, you would probably be marginalized by, you know, the, the power structure that would be looking at, you know, much more um, manly variables, if you will. Um, that sort of thing. So there's that going on even in the, mo in the best of, of circumstances. And resources are, are not there, you know, the financial resources, so that if you wanted to do, you know, uh, set up some serious programs, it would take uh, resources and they're not available. Um, but then when you get to some of these other countries, like you mentioned, um, that have much more restrictive attitudes about the cultural roles of women, then it's much harder to go in there and make any changes. And certainly over the years of this decade, they will have seen what happens to advisors that are going into, say, Afghanistan um, or Iraq, um, mostly, I think, Afghanistan, to work on women's issues that, you know, a number of them have been killed. Um, like, we're, no, we're not doing that here. It's also an interesting question. What happens when women and men migrate to a different society with di different gender norms and ideas, whether it actually reinforces the patriarchy or if it breaks it down? And I've seen different kinds of analyses of that around, uh, such as Nyla Kabir was talking about uh, in one of her books, Power to Choose, that some of the Bangladeshi women living in London were actually living in more traditional patriarchal social relations than those in modern Bangladesh uh, in, in the city, in the big city. So it's uh, at least, I don't think that one study uh, resolves that question, but it does seem like that's another question too. Does, it, does the migration break down some of these restricting uh, inequalities or does it build them up? Yeah, that, that, is, that is a very good question. And then it would be, you know, sort of hearing the, the voice of the, of the migrants themselves, the women themselves, you know, what were their interests in living the more restricted life when they were moving to, um, you know, a quote, more Western country? Is it because then they feel they are, you know, having some power and control in their own sphere themselves? Um, is it a protective mechanism? You know, why are they, are they doing this? Uh, I just want to show the Chinese uh, case uh, and add some comments on the point for you. Uh, as I know, the, um, a lot of like the American um, people would like to immigrate to China as not, I'm not sure if they really immigrate, but uh, just uh, stay there for a long time. Usually, they can get a higher position and uh, like the subsidiary company. Uh, I guess that's uh, motivated uh, about this reason. But it's totally different from what you said, like uh, the uh, Sri Lanka women <laughs> go outside. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, different. Um, uh, this is one. The other uh, issue is uh, other issue. Oh, um, like the chi China, we couldn't uh, like our government couldn't give the more uh, uh, so enough uh, labor or the jobs for the for so many, <laughs> you know, so many people. So that means we have over, over labor suppliers. So if they can go abroad, that's maybe helpful for the domestic, yeah, for the domestic, mm -hmm. for, for their resource country. So uh, and uh, uh, according to the like the America, you don't have this kind of so much so many, uh, like this kind of uh, uh, made, <laughs> or this uh, jobs uh, labor suppliers. 
So that's a really uh, substance subsidiaries for the, between the two market labor marketplace. I mean, between the high level the and, and the and lower, lower level. level. Yeah, that's a you know like the labor labor force trade. <laughs> right. So the reason is we should balance that. That's maybe helpful. The um, it, it, it is very interesting um, about people from um, you know Western countries or more higher income countries migrating into as yeah. professionals to take yeah, right. you know really to you know capitalize on market advantages is basically yeah. what they're trying to do you know get a market share get a foot in. Uh -huh. um, but then, you know, as you were as you were saying about China, um, you know, and, and the extra labor supply at this yeah, point, right. you know, with China's transition since, uh, you know, 1989 or whatever, yeah. um, and you know, one whole thing that I wasn't dealing with in this um, talk because I was talking about international migration, but is in vast internal migration within countries such as China. And you know, there's certainly been a whole lot written about people going home for Chinese New Year's um, this year. 20 million people possibly going home from Chinese New Year's, and from you know, from the factories on the coast, and not necessarily having jobs to come back to, because Chinese exports I think have fallen like 25 percent. You know, yeah. a, a stunning percent yeah. for an economy that is so largely based upon exports, and so. You know, then again, where are you, how are you going to reabsorb all these yeah. people into local villages? Or, you know, are these people that uh, could be sent on labor export programs? And let's face it, right now it would be hard to, s to place people abroad um, because there is this massive constriction almost everywhere in terms of employment opportunities. Yes. And we have another, like uh, what you said, that kind of policy to support the overseeing investment <laughs> to give the tax reduce. If like the oh right yeah so uh, the our government to support the immigrants to be uh, like the American citizen. So if they can uh, investment what they have uh, invest what they have earned. Mm, to China, so they can get mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, come back home with what, yeah. what you know, yeah. and and um, move development forward here. Yeah. So another a, interesting aspect of what you said, um, and it reminded me, Saskia Sasson, who probably many of you have read, had an interesting piece in the American Behavioral Scientist um, just the end of last year, and it was talking about two labor markets. You know, the high end labor market, kind of like you were talking about, and then the lower end and how actually um, there's spaces in which they interact. So um, the higher end, for example, needs the work of the lower skilled workers who are working as cleaning people or janitors in their, in their buildings, their workplaces. Or they need the work of these people at their homes, you know, to keep their homes um, right. So Saskia Sasson, who writes a lot about spaces, um, you know, it's identified this interaction between, you know, um, labor markets on these two levels, which is very interesting. Time to eat. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we need to quit at this point, but thank you very much, Jean, and look forward to reading more on this. Oh, from good. You. <laughs> well, and thank you for your dedication and for your very good comments.